to his work on using social network analysis for change. And hopefully that will be a method and an approach that you're using in your cases as well. So over yeah. to you, Pedro. Thank you, Anya. I'm sitting in the very back because I've never experienced sitting in the very back while <coughs> someone's mentioning it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as Anya said, we will explore in this class basically how to use networks in the context of management of change. Um, networks can be used in a wide variety of uh, uh, situations. and It has been used in physics for a while, in biology, uh, in uh, engineering of products, complex products, so you understand the architecture of products. And here we are using it in a situation that is a bit less uh, easy to actually um, grasp in terms of the interactions because the interactions to a point are things that you might think are a bit more eth ethereal, uh, less concrete in a way. So I don't know if that's better. Um, should I turn it up a bit? Hello? Yeah? Okay, we, whoa. <laughs> Is better there? Yeah. Uh, okay, I think uh, that will be fine. Okay, so as I was saying, the, the idea is that through this network analysis, we will under, better understand what is going on in, uh, in organizations. Um, I think it's a bit too much there. Okay, so I, I, will, I prefer to speak loudly rather than just with the microphone, but we will see. Um, a bit very shortly about me, um, I have been in the private uh, side for uh, not so long, but I have experienced that in the past. I have been an entrepreneur myself. Um, I have worked also as a lecturer before uh, and in the management of um, uh, this very small consultancy firm at one point. And um, well, now most of my time is just basically research. Uh, doing network analysis in the context of complex engineering design projects. Um, in terms of particular interests, um, nowadays it's mainly networks and complexity studies, innovation and technology management, and engineering design. You can phrase it in that way, but there are some other ways in which I will also sometimes phrase it. Um, about my PhD project, uh, it's basically uh, about network engineering design projects, so how these networks affect engineering design uh, projects that are fairly big and that you cannot really grasp in terms of complexity just by looking at direct interactions between a, a few people. This is about a lot of people interacting and creating complex behavior out of that interaction. Um, and I would like to start first to check uh, how it was uh, the homework that I left them uh, from last class. Um, how many of you did answer the questionnaire? I got uh, a fair amount, but not all, so just to have an idea. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, I received one comment that I think is, is very valuable in terms of, of one person that was concerned about privacy, and this is a good point to rescue this and this uh, moment. Um, obviously, when you go through any network analysis in companies, especially nowadays with privacy concerns, it's, it's not trivial. So you need to be very explicit about how it is used and perhaps I could have been a bit more explicit. Um, the purpose was that you went through a questionnaire that gathers network data yourselves, so you understand the limitations, you understand what do you feel, and um, at the same time, then work with the data that comes out of that questionnaire. Uh, everything is anonymized in the context of this uh, kind of brief, short uh, study. And, and it's only used in the context of this class. Uh, perhaps I should have been a bit more explicit uh, with that, but, but that's the, the situation. But it's, it's a good thing also to learn when you go and you do your own network analysis studies in companies, in organizations of any, any sort. Um, how many of you, or, or perhaps who has not installed Gephi and, and do anything related with the, with the quick start guide? Is, is anybody kind of complicated with that? Because if that's the case, then in the groups you need to be particularly keen on helping that person that perhaps uh, doesn't have in, in his computer Gephi or was a bit stuck with something. Uh, we will go through uh, how to play with Gephi a bit, uh, but, but try to help the one that perhaps couldn't get a, a hold of it. 
Um, and uh, also important, this thing of, of reading this very short article that will set the stage for the very basic principles of how to use network analysis. Uh, this class uh, learning objectives are basically uh, how to understand these network representations of systems. We I will explain a bit more what are these, these network representation of systems. Um, understand basic network analysis principles. There are certain principles. This is a discipline that has some years now, so, so we have a fairly good understanding of, of the basic principles that are underlying network uh, issues. Then to identify the use cases of network analysis in management of change and differentiate between relational and attribute data, which is basically your raw data when you do any sort of network analysis. And to apply network analysis using Gephi. And we will be iterating between Gephi and network analysis principles, so we do it as interactive as possible. Um, in, terms, in terms of where we are now, the last two cases was mainly probably around this area, uh, if you think in terms of the, of the book. Now we are getting a bit more into the domain of diagnosis and in particular open system models, gathering and interpreting information, stakeholder management, <laughs> communication change. These things are particularly suitable in terms of network analysis. The book doesn't really cover network analysis as such and that's why we kind of create this additional unit um, because we believe it's something that is, is increasingly important when it comes to uh, understanding organizations and management, managing change. Um, so as I was saying, we will start with a bit of a motivation, understanding why networks might be important at all, why we bother looking at networks. Is it, is it something beyond just kind of beautiful visualizations that have a lot of colors and, and links and can be useful when you are putting together some slides to impress the client or, or your boss? Uh, what is behind this representation? Because nowadays in social media, it's very common to find them. And you can produce your own very easily. But to interpret them, to analyze them, is quite a different thing. Uh, and, and we will try to be very explicit here about what it is behind all these, these visualizations and all these, well, not only visualizations, but numbers that explain uh, the network topology and the network structure in different, in different ways. Uh, then we will jump, jump straight into the basic social network analysis principle and network analysis through Gephi, iterating between, between the two. And we will have breaks along the way if, if at one point uh, um, I feel that we really need to wrap up something and we'll continue, but I, I will make sure we have some, some decent breaks. Uh, this lesson will be a bit different than, than uh, the, the normal lesson in the sense that we will use um, part of the time that you had for work group in working directly with Gephi in, in exercise and we will iterate between some things in the session as lecture time and uh, work time in your groups. And to start with, I, will, I, I just think that this picture is very, very telling when it comes to network analysis because you have the object that you analyze, like, so the tree as it will be in a picture, and then you try to synthesize what is important about this, in this case this tree in, in the middle, and then from there, you start looking at nodes and the connections between those nodes, okay? And what happens in, in this case, it could be the structural aspects of the tree, it could be how energy flows in the tree, how water flows in the tree, but the idea is that through the network, we kind of simplify this very complex architecture that has so much stuff on, and we focus on the stuff that might be very suitable for the question that we have in particular. Because, of course, we cannot really deal with all the possible networks in the tree. That it will be what network for transportation of water, structural, and so on. So we focus on one, and we leave aside a lot of things that obviously are very important to understand the tree, but we cannot really deal with all of them at the same time. And, and what we need to bear in mind always, and, and Anya has pointed out to this before, is that essentially all, mo all models are wrong, but some are useful. And, with networks, it's really easy to be tempted to think that you are looking straight into reality when you're looking at this complex network because it looks like it contains a lot of information, it's telling you a lot of things, but ultimately it's a system representation that can be very useful, but at the moment at least, with, with the resources we have, um, we cannot really fill it with all the content that we would like to. So really it's a reductionist ex uh, exercise, but a very useful one. 
depending on how you frame it and, and the data you have. And uh, one thing that is very important in terms of network structure and behavior is this idea that interactions matter, and interactions matter a lot. And in fact, as we will see, in some cases, interactions are everything. Um, if, if you see here, you see these blobs connected by kind of edges that are really sketchy. This is a bit what we find in, in networks, in reality. It's, it's very ill-defined. Both the, the element and the edge are not totally easily to represent in numbers. Uh, they cannot be immediately captured by, by one very simplified image. But, but we are trying to deal with this uh, in a way that, that makes sense somehow. And, um, and out of this complex set of interactions, we have behavior. Um, and we will see several examples of this. One very easy to understand example is, for example, molecules, or, or any subatomic particle to, will work very, very well. Um, in themselves, they are very, very simple. But it's how you organize them that you get all the possible behaviors. Um, carbon is a really interesting example because you reorganize carbon in all these different uh, ways, and you get totally different behaviors, totally different properties of the material. And networks are, uh, are a very good way of looking at this. And uh, another thing that is very important in networks is that when you think, for example, uh, on a car, a car is a fairly complex system. It's, it, it contains a lot of components, um, but it's not the simple addition of components that makes a car. The car is, is basically the, the pieces, but how these pieces are put together. If you take apart the car in, in uh, all its, its different bits and pieces, it's not any longer a car. And, and it requires a lot of expertise and very particular sets of interactions to turn it into a car as we know it. Um, and it's the same with organizations. It's the same with the brain. It's the same with, with a lot of complex systems. It's really how it is put together that makes the whole difference. And this scales to different levels. So we can have here um, uh, the car embedded in a transportation system. And how this particular car is embedded in this overall transportation system uh, makes a difference in terms of behavior in the city. And then this whole uh, number of modes of transport makes a huge difference in terms of the overall uh, transport uh, kind of dynamics in, in a given city. And if you think more concretely the sort of tools we use, these are two examples of the sort of tools we use. One is a matrix representation that is a traditional tool in, in engineering, sometimes called a design structure matrix or just an adjacency matrix that contains interactions between different components or elements in a system that can be people, can be um, activities. And, and it is in a square matrix that, that contains in both sides the same elements and then Whatever thing is here is basically because this element has an interaction with this other element. We won't get in detail here because we will play in Gephi with a network representation that is not based on matrix, that in fact is based on an alternative view that is edge list and then the graph. But we will, we will go through that. And then we have the more traditional uh, visualization of a graph that can be also in many different ways. There are many different layouts and we will explore some of them. Um, but to continue with the motivation on why networks are important, if you think in, in different networks around us, uh, it's surprising to see how much of a network structure, things that we have for granted as one element, are in fact just an amount of, of interactions that their particular pattern describes properties and functions and behavior. Uh, and the brain in, in the last decade has been really interesting example of this because all these pa complex patterns that emerge from really simple neurons uh, creates a fascinating complexity. The human body is another example. Uh, ecosystems are a very good example too in, in nature. Um, and you start realizing that perhaps there is something that doesn't really hold in terms of the way in which we normally analyze with very strict boundaries around objects that in fact you have something of a network inside of a network inside of a network. <coughs> and uh, in the case of organizations, um, we have the traditional organization chart and what it will be a network 
organization of the company. In this case, you can see it as an informal communication or advice network, where, in fact, both are somehow network representation. This is a very linear network re representation of hierarchies and is a network. Uh, and this is a less linear representation of how things happen organically. And in organic systems, you tend to have more this sort of arrangement. In inorganic idealized systems, you kind of create these network patterns that are a bit more artificial and you don't find in nature, in fact. And when it comes to information networks, this is a very nice painting uh, from Regina Bellucci that kind of shows you this interpretation that is really not just about one node, another node, and a very clean edge. It's a, it has a lot of variety, it has a lot of interpretation to be made, uh, and we are somehow trying to boil down the, the essence of this into, into an analysis that, that we, can, we can actually tackle. And, and another interesting example of continuing with, with network thinking is this distinction between information and knowledge. For a lot of people, this makes sense. You have information that is kind of a bit more dispersed, and when you somehow make sense out of it, you connect the dots, you get knowledge. But it's interesting because also you can think about data and information in the same way. If you replace here the word, the word data, the word information with data, and knowledge with information, it's exactly that. You have a number of data that you can turn into information. And then if you go even backward, uh, you can have characters that are turned into data, and so on. So it's just nested complexity that emerge from where something emerges that might be useful. And um, some issues that sometimes are forgotten when you do network analysis is issues about time, skills, and boundaries. Um, time is something that is a part of the nature of, of any network. It's just that sometimes we simplify it, making it very static. And it's a all right simplification, but you need to be aware of what that simplification means and what are you looking at when you see an aggregated network. If you don't have the evolution, you can make a lot of um, uh, analysis, but you cannot do uh, some analysis. So you need to look a bit more into that. And the scales is what I was just saying before, this nested complexity, and we will see other examples in a bit. So just to, to think about this nested, nested complexity and, and about the importance of interactions to build reality, you, you can think about um, this. I, I don't know how many of you have, have seen the film Power of Ten, which is a brilliant film, pretty old when I think 77 or something like that. Um, and it shows this different kind of a zoom in and zoom out uh, from the scale of a quark up to the further edge of, of the known universe. And it goes in a power of 10 from meters, and it shows you all this. But what is interesting from the point of view of a network is that you can start, in this case, with, with the, the, the nucleus of a carbon atom, and in fact, you can see in it uh, the, the structure inside this nucleus of a carbon at atom. Um, and then, actually, when you zoom out, you see the huge space before any electron I is there. So actually, when you think about the nature of, of reality and concrete objects, they are made out of void for the most part. It's just that the interactions make them to, to have some consistent nature, some, some rigidity or some properties. But they are essentially made out of void. Um, then you zoom out, and then you get to something that is a bit more recognizable for human scale somehow, which is a, 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 the base pairs of DNA that are incredible amounts of this uh, small interactions that add up and create, in this case, uh, a vehicle for information for the most part, because it's information what it is embedded in these particular interactions that, that, that bring the DNA its properties. Then you can go back to the chromosome that, again, is a sort of network that contains information that can be later on used in, in different ways. And if you really zoom out a lot, you have planets that have interactions that are not direct, but are based by gravity and things that we don't see, but are very real, and, and create um, reality as a network. To, to start wrapping up this kind of motivation, um, some interesting findings that are very recent in terms of, of network thinking and, and, and ways of interpreting realities 
uh, reality through networks is that um, in January, they just discovered these filaments of what they call a cosmic web. That if you see galaxies, it seems that they have a structure, they have modularity. And through these structures, in for, uh, energy and <coughs> dark matter, gas is transported. And that creates properties for galaxies and, and other uh, big uh, elements in the universe. Then, uh, even more fascinating perhaps, because it's very much on a human scale, I don't know how many of you have read this article. It's really, really interesting. Any, anybody? OK, so um, it was quite a thing when it was published, and it's also very recent, December 2013. Um, basically, they discovered that the brain uh, had, well, we always knew that the brain had uh, a modularity, but the modularity of the brain in terms of interconnectedness seems to have different patterns between women and men. And that might explain part of the different behaviors and skills and properties of the genders, intrinsic to the genders. And this is, uh, for many reasons, part evolution, uh, evolutionary process to a specialization of certain tasks anyway. Um, but what they discover is that in terms of actual um, brain activity is very similar. And that's why in all the scans you never saw any difference. But when they analyzed how this brain activity was distributed, they found out that in the case of the men, um, the part that is the cerebellum that is more related with acting, the interaction between right and left hemisphere was really rich. There was a bridge that was much more intense. Um, while in the women, the bridge that was most intense in terms of connecting left and right was in the cerebrum that is more related with thinking and, and kind of complex things related with thinking and integration of things in, the, in both sides. I cannot get in, in detail in the article. It's probably better that, that you read it. But the main point here is that this difference in modularity and how things are connected, in this case, left and right hemisphere, and through what they are connected, make a horrible, like a, a humongous difference in terms of, of uh, what sort of behaviors you end up obtaining. And it's just a rearranging, uh, rearranging modularities. Um, and protein-protein interactions, a number of, of different things that are very important and, and more related, coming closer to what is uh, our topic. Um, although I believe this is very important to understand uh, what we look at when we look at networks, is that nowadays with social network analysis, you can have really loads of information about interactions. And you can try to map this information about interactions against behavior. And, and because Facebook has so much data, they have played with things like the formation of love and, and how love breaks up. And they found out that just by looking at the interaction patterns uh, in terms of messages, and, 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 and they did some sentiment analysis, but not that much, it's mainly um, messaging patterns, they can see, they can predict when you go from single to in a relationship before you even know it. And uh, they can also predict before it happens the actual breakup of a relationship. So it's just by building up these mass amounts of information about interactions between individuals. A bit closer to what I have done myself in the context of uh, my, uh, my PhD. I have two big studies, um, mainly related with information networks. The first is about uh, how you you design and, and uh, finally manufacture a nano, nanotech flat sheet membrane. And basically, you see how all these um, teams interact between the different departments and so on. Um, I won't get in details yet. This might be uh, explored in, in my second network class. And then uh, dynamic information flow. So, not only this is static situation, but how these patterns change over time, and we discover certain properties that match well what we think or what the community thought will be uh, the stages of a design process. Um, and to wrap up and, and also take in consideration what we look at in, the, in terms of management of change, we can think that following a network perspective, change can be seen as a reorganization of interaction patterns. So our task as change agents will be seen as how we reorganize interaction patterns to get a behavior that is the one that we would like to have. Okay? 
And this can be at different scales, and this is the complex part. It's not just communication between individuals. You might need to think about cognitive patterns inside of individuals, and that's a scale that is so difficult to handle. Uh, but it's still about interaction patterns. And, and, and this is what I, what I was uh, thinking about, and, and a bit inspired by Anya's um, slide. You can think that here, you have this cognitive network that we saw before in the brain, all, all uh, networked inside. Then you have a number of conversations between the individuals, a number of communication instances and communication events that in themselves, they are kind of mini networks that come back and forth, forward. And then they are in the context of a big network that can be inside just one company, many companies, etc. And the complexity of this uh, management of change arises from this interconnectedness that is between systems uh, and between systems. And this is what makes very difficult to predict what will happen when you kind of introduce changes and when you try to direct changes in one direction or the other. Um, and related with this, we have this idea that I mentioned just before about modularity, near decomposability and interdependency. Modularity meaning that the systems tends to have kind of areas that are very dense in connections. Um, and that have a particular specialized function. Usually modularity is related with some sort of function that is special, that, that is radicated in one part. But that cannot be disconnected from the whole because it's part of a macro system that is anyway related. So you have these packets of um, modularity that are near decomposable. You can break them apart a bit, but ultimately they, they are dependent of a whole. That is the, the macro structure in this case, the macro design process. Um, and thinking also about what is what we look at when we see a network and what can we say. I think something that I have found out after looking at a lot of networks is that the network is kind of two things at the same time. When you look at the network representation, it's a substrate, meaning that is where you navigate, it's sort of the roads in a city that really uh, allow you to go in one direction or the other, but not anywhere. But at the same time, it's a catalyst. So it, it can be also seen as what can create changes. So it works a bit in both ways. Um, the network structure is, has an inertia. So if you see a picture of today of this class, for example, which we will see, that picture will dictate what will happen uh, in, in the future. But it can also be the, the originator of very important breaking points. Because when you reorganize this network, for example, in one of the hubs, that might change very dramatically the whole network. And this is what, what I try to, to show with this picture. that It has kind of these two layers as a, a substrate and catalyst. And the, the types of ties, relationships, interactions, they have a lot of names how things are connected, right? Um, in networks, can be many. Can be energy, can be information, material. So if, if we exchange things, uh, or in, in the context of, you know, an airplane, you might have fuel that goes through pipes. A number of things uh, that, that can be the con how a network is constituted. Um, it can be friendship that is a bit more difficult to really uh, pin down, but is there and we know it's real. It can be co-affiliation. If we are participants from the same organization, from the same department, that can be also a way in which we structure a network. It can be co-location. If we are in the same place continuously, this might mean some sort of relation. It can be spatial, financial, etc. And uh, to show you the first um, network representation with Gethy, this is um, a network representation of the class of last year. So what is... Um, Interesting is that we have the picture in the beginning and at the end. And what you can see here is a bit what we were describing, this sort of modularity. The reason for modularity in a system like this is a bit different to the reason of modularity in a car or in an organization where you have one system that is well-defined in terms of an objective that is a very common objective and you need to integrate with others. In, in a course, you might be totally isolated and still pass, right? As long as you interact in the minimum way with your group. But still, you see very similar phenomena. Here, in colors, you have the different groups. 
Um, so you see that for the most part, people do gather in the in the network based on 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 the groups, but the groups are formed because of being acquaintance, friends, or close friends. And um, you can see how let me just reorganize this. Um, how in the beginning it was a bit more of a a slightly more sparse network. Not all the individuals were connected. Um, but then after the first, uh, well, after they work and towards the end of the, of the, of the year or the semester, um, you see how things get a bit more concrete. And we will explore in detail this. I, it's not the time to actually go in detail, but this is the kind of things and how it looks, especially the intertemporal um, analysis. Uh, here you can calculate for each node how it changes in terms of its properties and the composition of the groups and so on. Now, what we have in a schedule is the paper discussion. We will have a short 10 minutes break and we will come back to this. All right? It's really fun fairly good way of starting, hopefully. And now we will look at um, this paper that uh, was in your reading list. And, uh, and I will appreciate as much discussion as possible in this part. I, it was not very interactive, the previous part, uh, because I just wanted to cover this, this basic. But now we have some sort of ground in which we can discuss. And um, well, these are some of the things that were discussed in the paper. The paper actually, I, is, although it's very recent, it doesn't bring anything too new to the table in terms of social network analysis, but it does it in a very nice manner that is obviously oriented toward practitioners because it's Harvard Business Review. Um, so to start with, what did you think about the paper? Any, anybody wants to raise a point about the paper, something that you found particularly interesting or perhaps a failure, something that was a bit too naive, all counts. Well, it seemed pretty straightforward, I think. And I was a bit surprised by the part that the guys against change, that you should you should keep them mm. in their own I was a bit surprised about that. But other than that, it was pretty straightforward, I think. Mm -hmm. Good, good point. I, I think uh, in general that's probably one of the things that you feel in the paper. Wow, they are telling you just to forget people that resist change. Um, and I think it's because they are trying to be very pragmatic in their approach and they are also thinking in terms of one change agent. So what, they, what it seems that they were trying to do is to give advice to one person that happens to be the change agent inside of organization. It's not that much at the organizational level of the network, but at the node level of this particular change agent. And uh, from their experience in, in this case in NHS and, and other, probably other experience previously, they, they have the, this, this prescription that I think is, is valuable in the sense that, especially when you have these people that, these fence sitters that can change and swap uh, sides, um, as politicians do, they, they concentrate also in them. Any, any other person that wants to make a comment before going into any other thing? You were just about, yeah? Uh, after the uh, yeah, after this slide, uh, there is just another one. But you, so better just bring it in. Mm -hmm. Because it implies that the only or the factor uh, deciding whether the controlling a network or not is whether people come to you for advice. Mm -hmm. And in my workplace, we're extremely specialized. So we don't do advice of each other because we don't really know about each other's expertise. But so, so, so there's a different factor there. In that's a very good point and, and it's also something that crossed my mind um, I think it depends a lot on the sort of question that you're trying to answer and on the organization 
in this case, it seems to be a good fit, simply because they were also starting from the, the, the point of, okay, we have a formal hierarchy, how much this can tell us, then we have this more informal hierarchy. And to compare hierarchies, sometimes you need a directed network, so you need to know the, the source and the target in Gephi terms um, in a directed manner. And advice is particularly good for that, because it's a form of communication that you can more or less identify who is the source, who is the target. Um, if you just say communication or information exchange, sometimes a bit more difficult. Um, so that's that, but but it's a very good point. Yeah, just to add on to, does, it doesn't matter. I think whether it's expertise advice or is, is it's just like personal advice, because you can also be in like the center of a network and people just come to you for all kinds of things. I mean, if they have personal problems, they uh, broke up with their girlfriend or something, and I mean. Then you are actually also in the middle because then people listen to your advice. So it's not only about like what you can actually, what your uh, special is, like what your expertise, <coughs> but more also you got like your social skills. How do people actually see you? Mm -hmm. I think that could be a factor. Yeah, I, I totally agree. What happens, and we will see it too, is that these networks tend to be actually what is called multiplex. So you have different kinds of relationships stacked one on each other and really um, something we simplify and we just say okay information exchange or friendship or whatever uh, because it's a way of making making it instrumental and looking at the data that we do have uh, but in reality you have in a normal organization friendship on one level information exchange on another um, respect or power in another you know and, and there are things that are very easily to gather and to an ask about because I can ask you, perhaps in a big organization, who do you receive advice from, who do you advise, in a fairly neutral manner. If I ask you about friends in some of organization, a bit more difficult. Um, if I ask you about, uh, you know, who do you have positive emotions or negative emotions, even more difficult. So, but, but yeah, definitely also a good point. Um, following with this, with the things that we see here, um, they make in this, um, in this paper this point about these cohesive networks and bridging networks. I think something that is good to bear in mind is that, again, they are thinking about the particular change agent, if you want, and how the network looks for the change agent. So from the perspective of Alex, his network is very cohesive. From the perspective of Chris, he's, he's a, uh, in a bridging network because he is bridging. So, I think sometimes how they write it uh, in this paper might be a bit confusing. Uh, it's very different when you talk from the point of view of the particular node to what, to what you say when you talk about the whole network, just to bear that in mind. Um, and, and in terms of, you know, a graph is simple. You can see it very precisely. But when you have different weights, but when the ties are of different intensity, it becomes a bit more tricky. They, they didn't cover this in the paper, but is, is part of what you need to face in reality. And, and what they say in this paper in particular is that you have um, different kinds of changes and you want to match um, your network type to the kind of change you're having. And so if the change is relatively, in terms of divergence, in terms of how disruptive the change is, is very low, you are well in a fairly, uh, you, you will do well if the network is very cohesive because basically you need to bring people that are already more or less in the same boat to change slide, slightly. You don't need to convince everybody to turn completely to another direction. When you are in the opposite scenario, when the change is very, very uh, dramatic, very disruptive, when the divergence of the change is, is big or high, then in these bridging networks, in these sparse networks, you have more opportunities to act strategically and use information with one group in one way, with another group in another group way, and eventually, you know, it's a bit this this uh, saying of divide and conquer is 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 not too far from that because basically you want to create a scenario where you step by step, and as they show in the example with the nurse that a step-by-step step goes from management to the nurses and so on, you are able to develop this strategy and convince the stakeholders in order. 
And some might be never convinced, but if you have enough critical mass, you go with the change. Um, and then they, they talk about, well, what, what we just say before about um, should we bother about who in the different cases. And uh, with resistors, for example, you, in, if, the, 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 if the change is very radical, you might not bother in a way because perhaps they, they are way too difficult to convince and the change is so dramatic that they won't be convinced anyway, perhaps. And, and, uh, and then fence sitters, you should always address them because they are kind of the hang, uh, low hanging fruit, you can say. And then endorsers, well, I mean, it's good to be in a good situation with them, but they are already convinced. That's a bit in, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, I don't know if there is any other comment that you might have or thing that you found in the paper that was interesting. Yeah, I think this is part of their focus on one change agent making all the difference. And I think that's a weakness of the paper somehow, in, in a sense, because well, it's, they, they were trying to tell a story shortly and with a you know, clear message. Uh, probably they have really this in mind, but it's hard when you have these cascading effects in a network, because then to explain it in a paper becomes a bit longer. But effectively, yes, you should think about, and we will see it in the networks that we will explore, that you have some sort of neighborhood that you can affect, and that neighborhood can affect the rest, and you can somehow plan these cascading uh, changes if, if you have the overview of the network. And uh, connecting with the book and, and the material of the course, basically how we look at these organizations is as open systems, but we draw boundaries simply because we need to, to make it feasible, right? But ideally, we will, we will have these boundaries, so we will have all information, but um, that's something different. And what you want is that there is an internal alignment. In this case, the network that you have is consistent between departments and with your strategy, with your change, the change that you want to introduce. And, and you have a number of layers in the system. You have the system as a subsystem component. In this case, the system might be a whole organization. The subsystem <laughs> could be different projects, and the components might be people, for example. But you can think in different ways in which you have these different um, layers that you study through networks. And sometimes you just concentrate in one layer, and, and that is fair enough. That, that can work. And uh, these key levels of analysis, that, that I think are a good way to phrase uh, the different alternatives that you have and the different things that you can look at is first, uh, well, just to explain briefly, this is part of one of my case studies, and we have different subsystems of this flat chain membrane that had to be developed, and they were developed in different kind of um, areas and with different people, different combinations of people, and so on. And here we can see eight different networks that were different subsystems under development or different activities that help in the development of two subsystems. Each of these networks can be studied individually, but in fact, you can produce a network that includes all of these uh, mini networks, if you want. At the compositional level, you have the people, in this case, activities, and you can see, well, compositionally, we have so many people from marketing, so many people from production, and that will be the composition. It was basically counting. And this is what we do usually with surveys that are not network surveys. We basically count. Then we have the relational layer where we say, okay, how this component, how these people are connected. What are the patterns of those connections? And the relational layer is the first layer that is actually talking about network analysis. Um, then the multimodal network level is that we have in these networks things that sometimes are not the same of the same nature. So we can have people and activities. And they are different elements, but they are participant in a big network. Okay? And then we have the ecosystem level that basically is what I, I was just describing before. You have several kind of mini networks, if you want, that form an ecosystem ultimately that contains all these networks and interconnections between these networks. 
And when you start analyzing something, you can break it down in this way. So you can analyze mini network. You might, in the context of the course, you might say, okay, this is a full course, but I might want to look network by network of each of the groups. And at one point, forget about uh, the things that happen outside of the group boundaries. And that will be a good example of this seen as an ecosystem. Um, we'll look more, more examples later. Um, and these network models can be in different ways. And I know it's a lot of, uh, in some cases, new words. Um, but bear with me, and then you will have the, the slides. And, and if you have any questions, just let me know. You have some networks that are valued, meaning that the ties have an intensity that you are somehow assessing. Okay, so in the case of the network survey that you filled, it was a valued survey because you have different intensities for the relationship. It was not, do you have a relationship, yes, no? It was three levels, plus the no. Um, and that creates a valued network. Then networks can be directed, and um, well, valued, and then the, the opposite will be non-valued network, or, you know, or binary network. Then directed is that, Unlike the network that you field, you, we might have focus on, for example, advice inside of the course. And we might see who do you seek advice from, who do you receive advice from, and then each of the ties will have a direction. It's not reciprocated by default. That will give you a directed network that has different properties and can be used for different things. Then you have this multimodal network that is the co this combination between elements of different nature, can be activities and people, documents, a number of things that you might be able to mix. When you go into multimodal mode, you get into a bit more difficulties and you need to be much more careful about what you're doing. And that's why in the context of the course, we might not recommend going multimodal because it is, it is a bit more difficult to properly structure. Then you have dynamic. So you have the evolution of the network over time and you might have different snapshots of the network. There are different strategies for, for doing that. And then multiplex, so you have for example, friendship, you might have advice, you might have communication, exchange, or information, or material, or finance, whatever. So you can stack these different networks, one on top of the other. And if you go really wild, you might combine in one set everything and have a network that has all these characteristics. In reality, uh, you usually find all these characteristics at the same time. Oh, sorry, I didn't see your... <laughs> Yeah, it depends on uh, the kind of thing that you're looking at. So imagine that we are actually looking at something like subsystems, whole subsystems. The subsystem might have a feedback loop in itself. Or, you know, sometimes you have these loops in terms of uh, finances that also go back. It, is, it depends a lot on the kind of, of system that you're analyzing. It's just good to bear in mind that in some cases, it might be like this. In the context of the problems we look at, it is unlikely, although you might make the case for it. Yeah. Good, good question. Um, and this is in terms of the, of the different kinds of networks. What I will show you now is how it looks, the network of this course, through your answers. And um, please, Stop me if you don't understand something or you find something interesting because to spot things is actually much better to have people that are inside of the network. I, I know it less than you yourselves, of course. Um, pretty sure it's this one. Okay, so when you just load the data, this is how it looks like. Um, there are different ways of, of creating the layout, but for the most part, the layout in a force directed graph that is the normal graph for, for network analysis uh, will look very similar. And you see that this um, network structure looks very saturated because a lot of people are at least acquaintances. Um, but these strong bonds that are friends and close friendships are what we see here in terms of the um, thicker, thicker edge, the th thicker tie between the, the people. So just to go even back to, to the very basic because it's not necessarily always clear. Each of these dots is one person, okay? Um, and the tie, the connection between two, we made it reciprocated. So you say that um, I am friend with so and so and so, I, I'm a, uh, I have these acquaintances, and the other person is likely to have said exactly the same, but there, there might be some 
inconsistency. So we just, for the sake of, of consistency, but also because in reality, usually friendship and acquaintances relationships are somehow reciprocated, um, we just uh, even out and, and we symmetrize everything. So everything is symmetric, okay? Um, and this also helps in, in two ways. One, for this inconsistency, but also because not all of you feel the survey. So how we kind of deal with that is that as long as somebody talk about you, even if you didn't feel the survey, this kind of completes the information set. It's not perfect, but you know, if the, if the incompleteness is below 20%, we can still work with that. Um, and then you, you might uh, you know, try with different, different layouts, as I said, it all depends on, uh, on what you're looking at. But going a bit more in detail, so which sort of things might we, oh, sorry, you, you had your... Yeah, there's like a point in the middle, mm -hmm. like the there, is that like a reference point, or is that an actual person? It's an actual person. <laughs> it didn't happen last year. <laughs> Apparently, somebody reported at least that it was acquaintance with pretty much everybody. <laughs> but I mean, it is possible. I, I did check though. I did check because I thought exactly the same as you did. And I thought, ah, this looks like somebody just pressed everything. But then it's because this, this should have some symmetry, right? So if somebody reports, the other one should report. And in fact, for the most part, somebody else reported. So it was very symmetric. It was not total kind of just uh, uh, marking everything. Yeah, that's, it's, it's something happened. Um, so that's, that's a good, good question. Any, any other question about the overall structure? Are you trying to guess who is that person? I, I, I said it will be anonymous, and uh, I will try to keep it anonymous. <laughs> Unless everybody is all right with, with not being anonymous. Um, any other point that you want to raise just on the overall structure? Because we will go through different things that you reported and how we can interpret. Okay, so I will go to the next stage. So when you have a network structure, you want to see some things. Thing, one thing that is typical is why this network structure? How is that there is or not a pattern that explains why there is a pocket here of people sometime, somehow highly connected, another pocket here, another group here, and then the boundary is fairly disconnected and sparse. Um, you might want to understand why is that, and if it makes any sense uh, in terms of reality. So what we do is we check with the attributes that you feel. So the relational was just all these lists of people, and you check uh, acquaintances, friends, and close friends. And that's all the relationship layer. We aren't seeing here anything else. The attributes are this one. So you feel ambition level, you feel, well, I feel the group because I forgot to ask that, so it was a bit extra work, um, nationality, and program. So those are things that we can use as attributes for um, understanding the network. After doing this, after, after uh, building the survey and, and looking at the results, I forgot that actually there was one attribute that was fairly obvious, and I didn't ask. I could have revealed, but I didn't want it. <laughs> uh, what, what attribute do you think is missing and it's fairly obvious? Gender. Yeah. I, I, I didn't ask for it. And at one point also I thought, uh, perhaps, you know, people would think that it's sexist or something. I don't know. But, um, but it's true. Gender should be a driver in this, in this um, network. Yeah, good point. Any other attribute? Perhaps I forgot something that is obvious. Um, here you see things like degree, modularity class, a number of triangles. Forget about that. That's a thing that we might see at one point, but is mainly related with network measures. So it's not an attribute that was reported. Any other thing? Okay. So we will start with sort of macro level parameters. And uh, something that is fairly macro um, is a program that you come from. So now. You can see there, I don't know if, uh, actually, let's see if this makes any difference. Um, you can see how the structure of the network has one driver that we can, we can spot fairly quickly that is 
the program do you come from? So here there is a pocket of people coming from in, uh, the Master in Design and Innovation, and then a fairly large portion that comes from the uh, Master in Engineering Management. Okay, fairly straightforward. You, you should expect that. What is interesting is that actually through this network view we can fill in the blanks. So not everybody filled the survey, but I can reasonably predict like this blank point. Because of the structure of the network, this person, this person is likely to be from a master in design and innovation. It will be, it's not impossible, but it will be unlikely that is um, is not. Okay, so this is, is something that you can start using the network for. If you have enough information about certain groups, you might fill the blanks given the network structure. Because of this kind of modularity principle and something that is called in network analysis homophily. So homophily means that you tend to group around people similar to you. And, and homophily is a very strong force in, in social networks. Homophily, it, it's just a way to say, yeah, you hang around or you connect with people that is similar to you. Um, so any, any other thing that you might want to say about this? I, I think there are a few things that are interesting, but in terms of program and the distribution of the network, anything that calls your attention? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Ah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I see what you say. Yeah. They might come from the same place. We will see with all the attributes, and we might might be able to sort it out. <laughs> okay. Well, you see, this is interesting. This is the kind of things that you want to kind of reflect on a network. How much the network captures reality and allows you to, you know, have a mirror of reality. Although a very basic mirror, but still. Um, okay, that's that's one thing. Um, moving on, we can also see um, other attributes, and we might compare attributes. So, another attribute that I think is interesting is nationality. Um, and uh, try to remember more or less the positions because you, when, when you overlap attributes in your mind, you start kind of getting the picture. Because one group formation might be the combination of two attributes. Because obviously you are more likely to be, under the homophily principle, you are more likely to be connected to people if you share the two same attributes. So that's, that's something to, to try to remember. So it happens that, for example, these three, that we saw before, the three are the I don't know if that, yeah, it, it makes sense, okay. Um, and again, you see another pattern, pattern emerging. You have a group here of other European, um, no, or non-Danish European, and a big group, although relatively sparse, of Danish. And I will probably say that chances are here you might feel with Danish if, if you had this information. Um, and it tells you another story about how people organize in terms of their nationalities. Um, there are some kind of people that might be particularly interesting in terms of, of um, or some actors, I, I will say, um, in terms of their patterns of connection. So for example, here we have a non-European that is connecting kind of very different groups and it's, one, it's kind of in an interesting position to be an enabler of conversations between uh, different uh, people from different nationalities, let's say. Uh, and, and this is something you spot really quickly when you, when you look at the graph. Same thing here to a less, yeah, to a big extent, similar situation. Another non-European that happens to have a lot of ties with uh, Danes and with uh, other Europeans. So kind of interesting locations in the network. Um, 
and yeah, I mean, you, you can look at a lot of different things, but these are some examples. Um, any, anything uh, in terms of nationality that calls your attention? That draws your attention? No? Okay. Uh, again, I said, uh, although we don't have all the information, probably you will have a lot of these dots in the periphery might be non-European or European, um, giving their, their social connectivity, if I had information. Um, and then something a bit more interesting, a bit hard to see because of the colors, and I apologize for that, but there's not a lot that we can do. Um, here we have the situation in terms of the group formation. So what you could argue is that these attributes that we saw before, plus the architecture of the network, drives a behavior that in this case is the behavior of creating groups. Okay? And how you create a group will have at least partially be, be influenced by these attributes and the net, this network structure. So the network structure becomes a substrate for this change that is group formation. Okay? Um, to make a bit more readable, I will add to the nodes labels, and the labels will be um, the groups. Let's see if this thing... I don't know why it's not done. Okay, usually it should work still. Yeah, yeah, I think it just froze. Uh, yeah, somehow, Jeffy, oh. I, I will, <laughs> this is what happens with Jeffy, because it's in Java, and uh, sometimes it can be a bit clunky, I need to restart, but this is, you know, a good thing to bear in mind, Jeffy is pretty decent, but it does, it does, uh, is, is in beta, beta. and, um, and sometimes you need to, to restart in order to make it work or restart completely. <laughs> Sorry about that. Any any other comment while I do this? Uh, it's quick because I have it saved already, so it should be fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now we go to global nodes. Labels. Uh, okay, that's what I wanted in the beginning. And partition group. Okay, so in terms of group formation, now that we have the names and hopefully this thing will last a few minutes without hanging, um, which things can you spot that are interesting in terms of group forma formation? Let me just leave it there. Can you still read? No. For example, the guys in the group changes. Um, uh, the third one in the info channel. Yeah. Yeah, they're all pretty good related mm -hmm. in the entire group. Mm -hmm. And group unknown. Um, yeah, here. It's not as well connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a good good example. So following with um, with the same Group unknown is true. It's not very well connected with the overall network structure, but between themselves, they are relatively close. So it's kind of a cohesive group, a bit outside of the main network structure. So they are not very or highly embedded in the overall network structure, but between themselves, they are fairly connected beforehand. All the things I'm saying now are in no way judging the quality of the group or anything like that. Obviously, you have groups of people that came before with a lot of connections and group of people that came before with less connections. So it has nothing to do whatsoever with a judgment of, of the quality of the group or the formation of the group. What is interesting is what you do with this raw material that you get in the beginning. Because what we're, if you were doing this for the sake of actually modeling performance or whatever, what you will say is, okay, this is what we have. A group that is very non-cohesive and in the boundaries, which sort of management will, will it require in order to succeed? A group that is very cohesive, very much embedded in the, in the whole network structure, whole different situation.
probably a different set of strategies to make it work. Um, uh, there are a number of things, but if you think in the paper, which sort of things comes to your mind? Because the paper that you read is, is basically about that. Um, if you think about the strategies about including or not including um, the ones against you, or mm -hmm. the uh, resistors, then if it was a non-divergent uh, change, then you have to include them. And if it was uh, a divergent, then you should not include them at all. You shouldn't care about them. Mm -hmm. So at least that, that's a strategy for like, should I include the resistors or should I not? Mm -hmm. um, depending on what kind of change you're doing in your group. Yeah, and, and I think you can uh, also put it as, do you want to go for, for example, a project or a case that is very different, very innovative, let's say, that, that creates certain tensions in the group that might be very different. So you might have somebody that wants to come up with something that is really bold, but it's more risky. And that person will have to somehow convince the others that this is a good idea. If the group is very divergent, uh, this has uh, one set of challenges that are very different, that is, if the group is already very cohesive, because if the group is very cohesive, you will think that you are more or less aligned up front, that you think similarly. Uh, you are close friends, you know each other, you know what to expect from each other. So these are things to, to, to think, because, yes, true, this is a case that is a bit kind of artificial in terms of management of change. It's, as I said, it's a course, but put it in your mind as something different. This could be, you know, a department inside of a university with research groups that each of them needs to, you know, deliver research. But they can benefit from cross-collaboration. So it's a system. Um, and some groups might be able to pull together knowledge that is very different, very diverse. But at the same time, they might be more in a situation that is more risky and then not being able to pull together anything because it was too dispersed. So, you know, it's, it's not too far from what you could find in a situation like a university department. I think there was another hand, you or somebody, no? Yeah, just checking. Um, yeah, so there are other, other groups here that we might have a, want to have a look here. Coder, very or fairly cohesive and reasonably central. Um, then uh, you have, well, these people that are here floating without group, I reckon are people that are not any longer in the course. Um, for the most part. So that, that might be the reason why they are kind of floating uh, nameless in the space. Um, any other thing that you want to, to say about it? No? Okay, one thing that you can do once, once you have this is to also think about which other sort of things that are a different kind of attribute might be affecting group formation and eventually performance. So what you can do is to rank using information that you have. So for example, and this is why I, I asked this ambition level, because I want to see if there was anything related with, um, yeah, the formation, I will, you know what, I will turn off the, the node labeling. <laughs> okay. Um, ambition, and we will make the size of the node relate to the ambition level, okay? <laughs> and obviously, that's very big ambition, so I will reduce the size of that ambition um, to something manageable. Okay, probably here one, here seven. Okay, that's a bit more clear. So some groups have very similar ambition levels, some groups have very dissimilar ambition levels, and again, this is another parameter that might allow you or not to, um, to, to have a um, group a good alignment internally. So this is more on the cognitive aspect of the network, if you want. This is analyzing what is going on uh, inside that particular box. And, and you might yeah, say that perhaps one driver, and this might be a hypothesis, one driver of group formation is not only nationality, it's not only uh, relationship, da, 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 but also ambition level, which is probably fair enough of a hypothesis. But you can test it, so this is the thing. You can pick up this information, take it to SPSS, whatever software you use for regressions, and test hypotheses. Boom, like that cohesiveness relate with blah or whatever. You can do that. 
and and uh, don't worry because I will go through an exercise just before you do your own exercise um, that I go step by step how to load the data in Gephi and all that. So so you you will be covered in that sense. Um, any other thing that you want to point out? I think uh, in terms of parameters, from what I want to cover now, I I show the basics that I wanted to show. Um, yeah, nationality, program, group, ambition. Yeah. Okay. So we can move on. Oh, yeah. When you do the production to the hospital, they the hospitals report that. I am recording it and I can make it available. Yeah. No problem. Um, you you had a question. Oh, okay, yeah. So this is the aspect that comes with dynamic network analysis. So at this stage, I cannot really show you causality, kind of tricky because it's just one point in time and I don't know what happened before. But I think it's a good exercise and, and if you are up to, we can do it. At the end of the course, we run the same network analysis, but uh, with the changes. And then we can see what the changes were and if this affects performance somehow. Because uh, obviously performance in a very small group is likely to be driven by persons, not that much by the overall network, so the cognitive network inside each of you and not that much the bigger network, but still, it's likely to have some aspect. Um, yeah, unless there is another question, we're close to um, the break. Um, yeah? Okay, so we have... A, Let's say, just not to extend ourselves too much, five minutes break, like short one, and then we come back. In the first